Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Geoeconomic Agenda, a new podcast from the Institute for Geoeconomics that investigates the connections between economics, geopolitics, business, and society. I'm your host, Paul Netto, and I'm a visiting researcher here at the IOG. We'll be sitting down with Dr. Kazuto Suzuki, director of the IOG, to discuss his thoughts on the role of geoeconomics and current affairs and to unpack some of the ways in which geoeconomic trends are having an impact on world affairs. But first, we'll begin with the latest developments and news in the world of geoeconomics. The Netherlands has reached an agreement with the United States to impose export restrictions on advanced microchip manufacturing technology to China, consistent with those imposed by the United States in October 2022. Dutch participation is expected to make U.S. controls on these technologies more effective, given that the Netherlands is home to ASML, one of the world's only manufacturers of a type of advanced production equipment used to produce high-end semiconductors. For its part, the Kishida administration is expected to introduce semiconductor export controls in an attempt to undermine the ability of other states to use those technologies for military applications. The new regulations will specifically revise a ministerial ordinance that will cover equipment at the same standards set by the United States in its controls announced in October 2022. Turning away from semiconductor export controls, Michael McCall, the Texas Republican who's now chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, told Politico that the Biden administration is thinking about how to stop capital flows into entire sectors of China's economy beyond semiconductors, including AI, 5G, quantum computing, and more, and would effectively prohibit any potential investor from working with Chinese companies that are active in these fields. If true, this would be a maximalist application of the Biden administration's argument that restrictions would be carefully tailored, with restrictions instead being applied to entire sectors rather than to specific technologies. At the same time, the Commerce Department is reportedly trying to narrow the scope of proposed restrictions on outbound investment, suggesting that internal debates within the administration are ongoing. In the meantime, the Biden administration announced that the membership of the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, APEF, would include Barbados, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Mexico, Panama, Peru, and Uruguay. Like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which APEF appears to parallel, APEF will include five pillars on regional investment, supply chain resilience, economic security, clean energy, and inclusive trade. Additionally, the Biden administration will begin talks with Kenya on high standard commitments in a number of areas. Like similar discussions under the Biden administration, tariff discussions are not on the table. The Biden administration has also formally challenged the World Trade Organization's ruling against tariffs imposed during the Trump administration on steel and aluminum imports for national security reasons. Turning to Europe, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz called for a quick resolution to negotiations on free trade talks between the European Union and the Mercosur economic bloc composed of Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay more than 20 years after negotiations began. This is the Geoeconomics Agenda with Paul Neto. Today we're talking with Dr. Kazuto Suzuki, Director of the Institute of Geoeconomics. He's also Professor of Science and Technology at the Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo, and formerly served on a United Nations panel on sanctions towards Iran. Today we're going to talk to him about the idea of geoeconomics, what it means in the modern world, and some issues that should be on our radar. Dr. Suzuki, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So to begin, how do you define geoeconomics? What is geoeconomics? Well, geoeconomics by nature, it's the combination of the geopolitics and the economy. So when we talk about the geoeconomics, geoeconomics is basically about the military 
foreign relations, foreign policy, according to the geography. So if you are an island country like Japan, then you are surrounded by sea. So naturally, you'll be you know facing towards the sea, and use you know the states are basically depending on the trade. Mm -hmm. So naturally, that is creating the situation that Japan's lifeline depends on the international trade. And of course, Japan as a country without uh, natural resources on the ground, which means that it has to depend on the other countries. But on the other hand, the, the history of Japan uh, through the Meiji restoration period and the modernization, Japan has acquired certain level of the technical expertise. So this again belongs to the geographical area of Japan and then use this technical expertise as the leverage to communicate and exchange with other country. So geoeconomics is basically the nature of the state uh, defined by the geography and the history and use the economic means as the, uh, as the tools to facilitate and exercise its power against the other countries. So given that this all sounds pretty fundamental to how mm -hmm. states work and how nations do their business overseas, how does the public, how do states, how do governments approach geoeconomic questions? How do they think about it? And how does the private sector think about these kinds of questions as well? Well, um, that's, a, that's a very good question and that is the most important question today. For example, the United States for, uh, is in competition, a strategic competition with China. And the, the United States regards, the government of the United States regards the gap, technological gap between the China and United States and try to maintain the gap and maintain the superiority in economy, in technology, and in military. So, for example, the, uh, the U.S. export control over the uh, semiconductor issues, that is one of the uh, elements that the government tried to maintain the gap between China and the United States. But on the other hand, that would have the negative effect on the private sector. The private sector will lose the access to the Chinese market and then there will be an impact on their businesses. So what happens is that uh, the government's interest, the strategic interest and the private interest, the industrial in the interest, often conflict in the geoeconomics world. So when we talk about the geoeconomics, I think it is extremely interesting to see how these uh, uh, discrepancies of the interest may reconcile or may compromise and how government and industry will be able to conduct the most effective uh, geoeconomic strategy. So I think this is the, the, the study of geoeconomics is focusing on this government industry relationship towards outside and also towards inside. So maybe the follow up on that somewhat. Can you elaborate a little bit on how tensions are emerging between public and private interests regarding something like the U.S. export controls on semiconductor manufacturing equipment towards China? How are the lines being drawn and so far as you are able to predict, how do you think this will resolve itself? Well, I think what, I, I think this uh, uh, export control over semiconductor is pretty well designed in a way to limit the impact on the private industry to, uh, to focus on the high-end chips. The United States is controlling the um, uh, uh, chips with uh, less than 14 nanometers, which means that the most advanced chips are under control, but the rest of the legacy chips are basically left in, you know, uncontrolled. So in that sense, you know, the companies which is with, uh, with the high technology and engaged in this, uh, you know, high-end chips, 
may have a certain impact, but the rest of the ma you know the majority of the the exchange or majority of trade on the semiconductor may be excluded from this uh, regulation. So I think uh, limiting the control is one way to solve the problem to limit the impact on the industry and maintain the you know the let the industry to to enjoy themselves for the much freer trade uh, with China and elsewhere uh, to do their businesses uh, without the government intervention. So if I can draw on some of the work of Susan Strange, mm -hmm. famous political economist, formerly of the London School of Economics, I was reading her this weekend, which is why it comes to mind. <laughs> but she, she writes about state-to-state -state relations, right state to firm relations, mm -hmm. firm to firm relations. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that the United States and Europe and Japan and other Asian countries don't necessarily see eye to eye on, you know, not just the semiconductor export controls, but also the broader relationship with China or other geopolitical, mm -hmm. geoeconomic, excuse me, I should say, uh, relations around the world. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile those different, differing opinions? I mean, it's always going to be a negotiation, mm -hmm. of course, but some of these differences are pretty fundamental mm -hmm. and also fairly essential to how different policies are going to sure. work out. Yeah. Well, I, I think this, uh, um, coming back to the semiconductor issue, hmm. The United States uh, has no control over what Japan or Japanese companies or the European companies do. So the, what the United States asked for was to implement the similar uh, regulation uh, by the Japanese government on the Japanese industry. And so as to the Dutch government and the Dutch industry. But as you said, there are different strategic views, different ideas. But I think the entire um, rationale of imposing such restriction is based on this United States idea of the, the chips are essential part of the security. And the, if China is able to access to the high-end chip, that makes the uh, Chinese military capabilities much, much stronger, much bigger. And that would be the threat to the allies of the United States, including Japan and the Europe. So I think as long as the United States is setting the goal, strategic goal of these geoeconomic measures, um, I think these will be convincing enough to, for the allies to associate with the US regulations and to implement the similar regulations because that if the United States imposing those uh, restrictions on the US companies, but if the Japanese or Dutch companies are allowed to export to China, then it eventually leads to the improvement of the Chinese military capabilities, which are the threats of the Japanese or the European security. So I think strategic interests of the United States are pretty much aligned with the other allies, United, uh, Japan and Europe and other Asian countries. So as long as the objective of these export control and the restrictions are designed to aim for the security objectives, I think it is, there is a possibility that the alignment of the regulations may happen among these allies countries. What if, as been reported by Politico and a couple other places so far, what if the Biden administration moves towards setting capital controls on entire sectors? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've seen this news or not, but not just, you know, semiconductors smaller than right. 14 nanometers, but say quantum computing, mm -hmm. AI, cyber, mm -hmm. maybe balloons, I don't know. <laughs> go on down the list. Right. How far can the United States go before it really gets some pushback from allies and partners? What is everyone's red lines here? Well, that's a very tough question. I mean, um, it's all case by case basis. I mean, um, the AI 
probably is the most uh, obvious case that the uh, you know the AI's application for military is pretty much clear and um, it can you know if the United States, Japan, and Europe and other allies share the same image that this technology may be used for certain uh, certain ways to improve the Chinese military capabilities, then it may be able to have a consensus among the allies. But quantum computing is far more, you know, it's far beyond the application to the military equipment and software hardwares. So I think it is very difficult to say this is the lead line today. We can't really know mm -hmm. what is the threshold of that this technology is okay, it's not gonna be harm, it's not gonna be harmful, but this technology is harmful. So I think mm -hmm. it is based on the uh, decision or based on the, it requires some sort of an imagination that these technologies can be applied for the certain military equipment or certain military um, you know, software or something that may improve the military logistics or military you know, operations, then there'll be a consensus or not. So I don't think there is a sort of a fixed lead line there. Um, there will be, um, these are much more negotiable, negotiating uh, issues to that the United States and probably other countries, including Japan, may take an initiative and say, hey, this is a technology which may be causing harm for us. So let's get the regulation aligned and, and try to you know, limit the access for the Chinese companies and Chinese government. So turning from semiconductor export controls, what would you say are three or however many you want to list, what are some issues in the geoeconomic sphere that you would say should be on people's radar? Let's say from the Japanese point of view, I think um, uh, the most important and biggest object of, on the radar is the Taiwan Strait issue. Whether, when and how the China will have certain, whether China will invade on Taiwan, in what way, at what time, this is always the big issue. It's not just geostrategic, geopolitical issue, but also it has a humongous impact on the geoeconomics because on the one hand, the, the you know Taiwan Strait is the major sea lane for traffic of the commodities uh, from Asia and the Middle East. And also the, if there is a military invasion, then there will be uh, uh, sanctions on China and the economic sanctions may have a, a significant impact on the Japanese industry. So Taiwan Strait issue is by far the largest concern. But probably the second largest is the US regulations. I mean, this not only the semiconductor regulations, but the CHIPS Act or Inflation Re Reduction Act. You know, there are so many uh, economic regulations which have a, a lot of implications foreign companies and uh, you know those companies that, that are investing in the United States and investing in China so um, I think these you know US regulations US legislations are now being a very heavy hotspot for the Japanese companies to, to concern uh, because U US market is still is the largest you know, a, a partner and the largest market for the Japanese companies, as well as the, the Chinese market. So the US regulations may have a very strong impact on the Japanese businesses. Perhaps when we talk about the third, I mean, this may be an, a, another obvious one, is the uh, sanctions against Russia. So Russian sanctions uh, are already put in place for, you know, almost a year, but there will be a further request for the tightening the sanctions, you know, cutting off the cutting off the uh, the financial um, uh, links, and perhaps for the Japanese, it is the biggest concern is about the natural gas from the Saharin II, which is the Japan's national project to diversify the source of the natural gas from the Middle East, 
and the Saharan II was the basic national strategy to get the natural gas from somewhere outside of uh, Middle East and Australia. So uh, this has been a big problem for Japan and uh, if there is a much tightening control over the import from uh, natural resources from Russia, then that will be a big problem for Japan. Okay, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much. I'm Thank sure you. we'll be speaking again in the future. Sure. Thank you. This is the Geoeconomics Agenda with Paul Neto. That was Dr. Kazuto Suzuki, Director of the Institute for Geoeconomics. Finally, since this is the very first episode of our new podcast, we thought we'd dive back into history to see when the very first goods were traded. Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty about this question. No one thought to have written anything down because writing hadn't been invented yet. And besides, exchange and bartering is a common human activity anyway. But while bartering economies might be common, transporting goods over long distances for the purposes of exchange is a much different task. Again, there's a lot of uncertainty on this question, but it's thought that one of the first trade networks opened around 12,000 BCE and that one of the earliest traded commodities was obsidian, a hard stone that, when chipped, provides an extremely sharp surface that's useful for tools and hunting. Anatolia, or what's now modern Turkey, would have been the primary source for obsidian, and the stone from this area has been found in Egypt, Iran, and the Levant, or modern-day Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. Getting the stone to those places would have required it to have been carried on foot over distances as far as 900 kilometers. It's not clear how they would have done this. If it was a solitary individual crossing a distance roughly the same as Washington, D.C. to Indianapolis, Indiana, or if there was a system to relay the goods across that distance or something else. But it would not have been easy, and the stone would have been relatively expensive and therefore highly valuable for the trip to make economic sense. The reduction in the cost of transportation is one of the most important factors that has enabled modern commerce to become so globalized. This is something that early traders would have recognized, and they relied on the domestication of the horse and camel to help bring down those costs, even if the goods these animals were carrying were still relatively expensive and mostly for elites rather than for regular households. In modern times, the cost of transportation has become so low as to make the presence of international products in our home routine, and disruptions in that process can disrupt our everyday lives. The products in our refrigerator, and even our refrigerator itself, show how far we've come since the days of obsidian crossing the foot trails of the Fertile Crescent. That's all for this episode, but stay tuned for more on the way. Until then, we want to know what you want to hear about, as well as take your questions for our show. So send us an email at geoeconomicagenda at ihj.global. Be sure to like, rate, subscribe, wherever you get your podcasts, tell your friends, and most of all, keep listening. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to the team at API for making this happen. And we'll talk to you next time.